Climate change promises to bring many negative impacts. Extinctions, extreme temperature events, uh, increased hurricanes, but the most universally feared consequence of climate change is flooding. The idea that water will reach places in our man-made environments and our cities that were never intended to host it. In climate adaptation, resilience, the term resilience, is almost always associated with flooding now. Our fear of flooding uh, traces back to the story of Noah, and the plot is a familiar one. Uh, mankind's misdeeds and excesses bring about a terrible environmental event. Uh, mankind uses technology, uh, in Noah's case, a very well-designed ark, uh, and a rudimentary understanding of ecological systems, in his case, uh, animal husbandry, to weather the storm and save mankind. Uh, like Noah, we actually have the technology to protect ourselves from floods. But the problem is not a technological one. The problem is really a social one. Our cities are not just physical places with buildings and roads. Cities are a complex set of social and legal relationships. And unless we adapt to a, a design and a plan that can um, accommodate those things, uh, we are going to be in trouble. So I submit that in order to more fully adapt to flood change, that we are going to have to rethink our entire notions of public and private uh, and how we relate to each other in these environments that are going to be threatened by flooding. We've had the technology to separate ourselves from water for centuries. Uh, it's simple. You put a pile of dirt or stones between you and the water, and generally you're safe for quite a while. Uh, more uh, sophisticated versions of this uh, do other things besides keeping water away, like this dam in the Netherlands, which uh, balances the flow of the tides between one body of water and the other, uh, and also provides a bridge to connect two dry pieces of land. More current thinking about uh, protecting ourselves from floodwaters are trying to incorporate natural approaches, such as this breakwater, which not only softens the impacts of waves, but uh, harbors and engenders and incubates all kinds of nice natural activity, like natural grasses, oysters, and things of that nature. At the other end of the spectrum of current solutions are what we call deployable solutions. These are the proverbial finger in the dike that can be deployed at the last minute uh, and are meant to plug up those holes in our infrastructural system uh, where uh, the land or the topography are uh, specifically very vulnerable. But the problem with cities uh, is that uh, while these solutions are actually pretty simple, cities are actually complicated places. Um, they're not just buildings and roads. They are a complex and messy stew of underground infrastructure, jurisdictional boundaries, uh, subways, drainage, uh, utility companies, uh, all sorts of legal boundaries that make up this sort of complex stew of what a city really is. Um, the most important thing about cities is that they provide the infrastructure and the physical space for us to navigate between our private selves and our public space. Uh, cities provide the right kinds of boundaries uh, uh, that allow us to coexist with ever-increasing densities of, of people. Gian Battista Noli was perhaps the greatest cartographer ever, I think. He mapped a famous map of Rome in the 18th century. And what makes it so spectacular is not just the detail with which he did it, but it's a map that actually distinguishes between public and private space. Rather than show an overall view of the city, uh, like an aerial view, 
uh, he cuts the ground plane in such a way that you can see the ground floors of all the public buildings that are publicly accessible, so that every space that is publicly accessible, including outdoor plazas and the interiors of public buildings like churches, are rendered in white. Any spaces that are private, uh, such as residences or apartments, are rendered in black or gray. In North America in the 20th and 21st century, we also have these more nuanced uh, understandings of public and private space uh, in our urban environments. Take the stoop of a brownstone, for instance, which is not just a series of steps that get you to a parlor level of a, of a townhouse. Um, that stoop describes actually a very important zone, a zone that is both legally documented, but more importantly, is a very critical social space that allows the private to mediate uh, uh, with the public, provides a protective layer, it provides a place for socializing, knowing about your neighbors, uh, fostering other kinds of small economic activity. The front yard is an important social space in our culture. It's also legally enshrined in our zoning codes. Um, it has a name, it has dimensions, um, it's embedded in the way that we order ourselves relative to our urban environments. The problem with legal definitions of front yards or social activities in front yards um, is that floodwaters do not discriminate about such things. Floodwaters like to go wherever they like to go. There are really two solutions to this about what to do. What to do at that point where floodwaters approach in the public realm and begin to collide with the private realm. Uh, one is to take private property and to simply elevate it. The other is the reverse. Take the street, take the public property, and you elevate that. Neither of these solutions are particularly appealing, I think. In fact, they're sort of, call them version 1.0 of flood resilience. In a typical sidewalk condition, really the only thing separating us from uh, the, the public and the private is this thin red line here, this thin red dashed line that represents a property line. That boundary doesn't do much good for us uh, when we're experiencing a flood event. It will not discriminate against private property or public property. I think what we need to be thinking about are configurations of public and private property that are more complex, that have much more overlap, and will allow for things like elevated sidewalks on private property, uh, cantilevered building elements that come out over the public property, uh, some sort of more complex, nuanced dance between public and private realm that will allow most of the private property, the building, to withstand a flood event. Long term, I think that we have to think about this not just two-dimensionally, but at the block scale and the building scale. How do we actually redesign entire city blocks? Uh, how do we build in kind of templates for building typologies that can adapt long term to what might be an elevated public realm in the future? Take, for example, this idea of a kind of courtyard block that might be fine for now and has its public realm happily at grade. But imagine when the flood comes uh, that you can actually build a whole separate set of streets that comes right through the middle of that courtyard. What you begin to see is an idea of a public realm that literally begins to turn itself inside out. Um, and I believe that this is the kind of thinking that will produce a much richer uh, more livable, more sustainable, and more complex urban environment. These kinds of urban forms uh, are plentiful in pre-modern cities, um, such as Stockholm, where this building is. Um, the actual entrance to this building is just a hole in the wall, but when you get inside the middle of the block, you realize that the front is actually in the back. Um, this is a beautiful example of the ways in which, uh, if we think beyond simple notions of front yard and backyard, side yard, that uh, if we think about turning our urban environment and our sense of space inside out, that we can not only enrich 
our sense of what is public and what is private and how individuals relate to communities, but we can begin to use these techniques to help us adapt to flood risk. I think that, uh, in the end, uh, designing for flood resilience is not just a technological problem, it is not a simple design problem, but I do believe that we have a kind of generational opportunity to really rethink uh, more boldly how we redefine our public realm and how we think about how individuals relate to their collective community and how to create much more vibrant uh, and interesting complex cities. Thank you.